Jack Kareem. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research, also probably airing on Israeli News Live. This, of course, we have entered into the Passover season, started on Friday, and I wanted to take the time out to share this with you. I really, really wanted to do this during Passover, and in a way, I'm kind of thankful I didn't because the Lord began to reveal more things to me about this. But I was in prayer, and I asked our Father, I said, Lord, is there something you could reveal to me about the Passover and that in light of Yeshua that would be a blessing for the people? And there were two things that he revealed. One yesterday, immediately after I prayed and asked this, and then a second one this morning. Uh, on Here it is on Sunday morning. There are many churches that uh, they celebrate what they call their Easter holiday. I'm not going to go into that issue at this particular point, but... Uh, uh, it, it, the Passover did start for the Jewish people. We have seven days of Passover, which also goes all the way until uh, the next Shabbat. So this is where we're at in Passover season right now. This is the day after the original Passover. And I want to start by reading here. It says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, and just for the sake of the Hebrew, for a few seconds here, let's just let's read that first part because it's like it's an, it's the original inspired language that God spoke to the children of Israel. Although the alphabet was different back then, we had a Paleo Hebrew versus the modern Hebrew we have today. It says, el Moshe el excuse me, be'aretz Misraim le'mor." Okay, the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you at the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. That's why I always say, why do we celebrate uh, the, uh, the beginning of the year during the, uh, the feast, uh, during uh, uh, Sukkot, etc., is really kind of awkward because we know that the Passover is really the true beginning of the year. Our calendar is even set up that way, but yet we come around uh, uh, Yom Sukkot and Yom Kippur and we say, Shana Tova. Well, today, is, this is Shana Tova. Okay? This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak you unto the congregation of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. And if the household be too little for a lamb, then shall he and his neighbor next unto his house take one according to the number of the souls. According to every man is eating, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it unto the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at dusk. And they shall take of the blood and put it on two side posts of the and the and on the lintel upon the houses wherein they shall eat it, and they shall eat the flesh in uh, in that night roast with fire unleavened bread and bitter herbs and they shall eat it and eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water but roast with fire its head and with its legs and with the inwards thereof. Sorry about that. It froze up here for a second. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, but that which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, many of us already know. We know this story. We know the types of this, the type of Christ, etc., uh, incredible, incredible things that we can see from this, that Yeshua was the, the Passover lamb. And uh, of course, uh, we realize that this was a type of what God was uh, showing that was going to come in the future. But there were some things, though, that the Lord showed me uh, when I asked about this, if the Lord would be willing and so kind to share with me something I might be able to share with you that I felt like would really be a blessing. And there truly was some things that he shared with me last uh, yesterday uh, and as well as this morning. And so I really want to share those things with you today because I think it will truly be a blessing. And here's what some of the things were that the Lord began to show, show me in this. He said, uh, showed me here in verse 7, And they shall take of the blood and put it uh, on the two side posts and on the lintel upon the houses wherein they shall eat it. Now, that's going to be the first one. First of all, I want to jump over to 
John, and this is where the crucifixion takes place here, and I want to just read a little bit of this, starting in verse 17, And he, bearing his cross, went forth into the place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two others with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, if you write that out in Hebrew, it literally is yod heh vav heh the beginning of each letter of each word there. It shows you who the divine, the divine creator was. This title then read, Many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests and the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments, and we know the rest of the story there. They parted them. So many things that God has revealed to me about that I've shared with you over times past. The crown of thorns that was upon his head, of course, showing that he was the same God that was in the bush speaking to Moses that spoke from the midst of a, what a thorn bush. And here God was again, the king was there on the cross in the midst of a thorn bush. He was speaking out to the people. All right. Now, as we read all this in here, though, these were some of the things that the Lord really began to, to deal with me on. We saw that on either side of him, there was a thief. And above his head was written the title, the King of the Jews. Now, it's no small thing then when God says to Moses, they shall take of the blood and put it on the two side posts and on the lintel upon the houses wherein they shall eat. Uh, they shall eat it. That represented the crucifixion itself. The fact the two lentils of the post showing that the blood of two prisoners on either side of Christ would be killed. That crown across the lentil, excuse me, the two side posts. And of course, over the lentil, over the top of the door was a sign written, the king of the Jews. He is the door. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And of course, they placed that above him, showing that he would be crucified as well, right in the middle of them, the two posts there. And of course, there you have it right there, what that representation is there. And they shall eat of the flesh and they at that night roast with fire and unleavened bread with bitter herbs. They shall eat of it. Eat not it of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire. It is the head with the legs and the, with the inwards thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. Now that's another interesting uh, parallel to the Christ himself when he was killed. All right. Now we have to keep in mind he died. And there's a lot of debate over this because people say, you know, well, uh, Jesus said that he would be in the heart of the earth three days and nights, as so was uh, Jonah. Uh, and they say that he never really was three days and three nights, if you look at it in that case there. All right. Now, it is an idiom in Hebrew. Uh, for example, if we say that uh, a king served three years in Israel, it could actually be a 14 month or 15 month uh, situation. But if it falls in that previous year, the year that he actually serves, and then the next year, we call it three years, even though in reality he never served three years. Now that's, you know, we might call it an apologetics, and I'm not trying to just justify something here, but in, in, in a Hebrew idiom, the three days, three nights can actually represent that because we call it three days, which would we consider to be three days and three nights. That could be where it is because there's some believe that he was, he was killed on Thursday, uh, but we have in the book of John, we have the preparation of the Sabbath, which would be on Friday before the Sabbath begins. We also have the fact that uh, uh, we read in another one of the Gospels before this would have been uh, before it was daylight. When Mary comes to the tomb, the tomb is already empty. And we believe that to be on uh, the first day of the week, which would have been uh, uh, Yom Rishon, which would have been Sunday. Now, Here's the point, though. When she comes to the tomb, the tomb is already open and there's nobody in it and the sun's not even risen yet. And I believe the point that I really want to get into rather than getting into the days of how many days was he there, etc., or what day was he crucified on, it's still the type of the fact that he was not there. And this is what that sacrifice when it says, and you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. Why? Because it showed that Christ before the morning, before the resurrection itself would have taken place. 
Now I realize we're skipping a day, but it's the fact that the, the, the point of it is, is that that morning before the morning came, Christ was already gone. His body was already gone. So a type in this here is that Christ typed that sacrificial lamb that that body was not there when the morning came. So when Mary goes to the tomb before the sun had risen at early morning, there was no body there. When did he rise? When did he leave? We don't know. But there it is again, another beautiful uh, type of Christ and the true pass, and him being the true Passover lamb. And thus shall you eat it. You shall uh, with your loins girded, with your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. The staff is another very interesting, uh, beautiful word right here that is used in the uh, Hebraic language. And uh, just interesting to me to begin with that uh, the, 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 the choice of the verbiage is being used here because that staff, we know it's considered a rod or a, or, or a stick, but it's also a, it can be a clan. It can represent a tribesman of each tribe that they may be a part of. But I always believe that it also represents the DNA of the individual there because why? This was written on the table of their heart. As the words are being spoken by Moses, it was placed in their heart what was there. And they were to have that in their hand, their staff in their hand as symbolic. Because why? I think Micah chapter 7 tells us exactly why. There shall be a day when they shall come unto thee from Assyria, even to the cities of Egypt, and from Egypt even to the river, and from sea to sea, from mountain to mountain. And the land shall be desolate for them that dwell therein, because of the fruit of their doings. I believe that that prophecy was fulfilled when Syria became ransacked, which is part of Assyria, uh, because of what? Because of their doings, which means uh, the people that are living in the land, it can also represent the Jewish people, Israel, because of their own doings, because we do have what? We have uh, Israel and the United States and, of course, different NATO countries there that have that cooperated in trying to overthrow Bashar al-Assad. And the U.S., in essence, represents some of the lost tribes of Israel and Ephraim being of the British Empire and that being spread into the United States, the NATO forces there. We created this whole problem in the Middle East. So the land has become desolate because of our own doings. Micah is setting the stage of what it would look like in the Middle East right before verse 14 happens. And he says, Tend thy people with thy staff. Literally, Ro'e'amcha b'shebedecha. All right? Feed your people. All right? Ro'e. Ro'e is, to, is, uh, ro'e is like pasturing, taking the sheep out to the pasture. Feed your people with the staff. See? The staff of your heritage. All right, what is this? This reminds me of Moses is what it reminds me of. And what he says over in Exodus 12, that they were to have their staff in their hand. Now, it's a different word. Uh, Shabbat is the word used here. Still carries the same meaning. It is a rod, but it is literally, he's saying to take his staff. And then he goes on, see, on Nechaladecha, which is the rod of his heritage, of his ancestry, all right, that dwell in solitary as a forest in the midst of the fruitful field. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. All right, Gilead is very important because as I brought out to you guys before, this is when Jacob and Laban made the covenant together that they would not pass over that heap to do harm to the other. And also Laban prophesies and says to Jacob, do not take any other daughter's other than my daughters to be your wife. Ahab broke that covenant when he married Jezebel and brought a Zidonian, who was part of the Nephilim, into, into their country. Which, by the way, speaking of the Zidonians and part of the Raphaim uh, race there, when it comes to Israel, when it comes to us defeating the enemies of Israel, when people say, because somebody made a comment just recently, and they were saying that, you know, Steve, you don't support Israel's right. God gave them the land. He told them to go there and drive the occupants out. 
You know, God also told Esau to drive the occupants out when he came down there to, to, uh, to, to southern Israel in that area there where he was given that land. And so did uh, Lot's children when they drove out the occupants as well. But you forget who the occupants were. They were Rephaim and Nephilim. They were the giants that were living in the land. They were fought part of a falling demonic race that had made it back into this world once again like it was before the Andalusian destruction. This is who David fought against. This is who Saul fought against. This is who the children of Lot fought against, the Zemzemims. Okay? David fighting against the Raphaim, the giants. It wasn't because they were big nations. It's because they were demonic people that were living in the land. Huge people. And God had sent us to drive out those occupants. And yet you have biblical prophecy after biblical prophecy that shows the error we would make in this day by killing our neighbors. It's not the same, friends. It's not the same. God will protect Israel, but we must keep his commandments if we expect to be protected. When, when Abraham came down to the land, Abraham didn't go in there and kill all the occupants. Abraham purchased what he what he had desire of. And even though God said, I've given you this land. But by the time Moses and Joshua came up, they were dealing with a different issue altogether. Major issue were they dealing with. So, in this case here, God sends Moses and Elijah, and it has to be Moses. I know a lot of people say, oh, it can't be Moses, it's going to be Enoch. All right, I appreciate that. I'm not against you because you believe that. But we didn't only leave God when we left Samuel the prophet and forsook God as being our king. We left God originally when God wanted a personal relationship with Israel. All 12 tribes before we were ever split, split back on Mount Sinai. When God comes down in the midst of the people when Moses was the prophet. This is when God wanted to have a true relationship with our people. This is when the spirit of God came down like a fire. Like it was on the day of Pentecost. And Moses was the one that was there. So the only one that can take you back to where you failed God as 12 tribes originally is with Moses himself because he was the one that was coming to introduce God as Mashiach. And we rejected him. And then Elijah forerun the Mashiach in a human body. So Elijah and Moses must come together. And if you look at the scripture, God says here, and Micah, as in the days of thy coming forth out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him, mar not marvelous, Nephilot, wonders. Wow. Do you not know that's over in, uh, what is it, uh, um, Exodus chapter 34, when God says to Moses, I will show you wonders such as I have never done in all the world. When's Moses going to fulfill it? That was after the parting of the Red Sea and all the plagues in Egypt. Okay, so he has to return. And what does he have? He has the rod, the staff of his heritage. In other words, it reminds me of Elijah and Elisha. The spirit of Elijah rests upon Elisha. But in this case here, it's even different. This is going to be a descendant of Moses himself all the way down from the time when Moses was here. That staff, that DNA that has gone from son to son to son to son to son and Moses' heritage there will be in this day somewhere along the way and will be anointed with the same spirit that was upon Moses. That's my thought. That's a conjecture. Can't say it so, but it looks like that. And so what we have with the Passover, the beautiful type so, is again, as I said, the crown of thorns that were upon Yeshua's head was that type of God speaking from the thorn bush where he spoke to Moses. The two posts where they put the blood upon the post and upon the lentils represented the two thieves that were crucified on either side of the door which was Christ. Christ was the door. The lentil itself over the top of the door because why? Their king had been once again rejected and killed. That's why the blood was over the lentil. That was Rome's part in this. Because even though he didn't want to kill Jesus, they did it anyway. All right? And then, of course, 
that lamb would not be left over to the morning. Before the morning would come, Jesus would be gone from that tomb. Now, I'm not talking about the fact that we know that Christ died on the eve of Passover and it not being the fact that he rose up the Passover the next morning, but the fact that he rose up on the Sunday, the first day of the week morning, but before it was morning. Now, we don't even know when he actually rose because the scripture really just tells us that the tomb was already open. He was gone come Sunday morning. Very interesting, very interesting indeed. Some very beautiful insights that I wanted to share with you. And of course, that staff, that DNA, I think is so beautiful there. Micah's prophecy, so much to be said there in Micah. If you're watching this on the Institute, check out Israeli News Live. We, we released a broadcast there today uh, dealing with the situations that are going on in Israel because there's so many people that are uh, speaking to us and they're, you know, we're getting... Uh, a certain group coming in that are against what we're saying because we're willing to tell the truth of what's happening. Uh, they're saying there's other channel out there that, that tells what the real news is going on in Israel. Uh, and I reminded people there of the ungodliness that our government does do. Uh, there are some good politicians on Israel, and I believe that, but there's also an agenda, and that agenda is to promote what Rome wants, just like Moshe Sharit and Ben-Gurion, the first two prime ministers of Israel, were promoting Pope Pius XII's agenda. We have those in power today uh, asserting Pope Francis' agenda for this day as well. And so we're going to expose that one way or the other. And it needs to be said, because not everything that our government does in Israel is of God. And I know some people think that it is. And we dealt with that issue in our broadcast here on April the 1st, 2018. Check out that broadcast on Israeli News Live. Stand with us, support this ministry. We do need your help, and we appreciate it.